Welcome to the new school. Thank you all so much for coming. I'd like to open by thanking all of the panelists and all of the organizations that helped build the wonderful crowd we have here today. A special thanks, of course, to the Center for New York City Affairs, uh, the institute here at the new school that hosts today's event. Last night, I had the honor of serving on a panel with two federal judges, a distinguished scholar, and a top Bureau of Prisons official. At one point, the BOP official described the quote unquote, extraordinary array of opportunities for personal, prof professional, moral, and spiritual growth available to all of our prisoners. <laughs> he had recently taken the judges on a tour of the federal prison at Otisville. Clearly, Otisville had impressed the judges. They offered effusive praise for the prison's wide variety of educational and vocational programming. The parentheses carefully selected prisoners with whom they had met and the positive culture that the warden had worked so hard to help build. Now many things struck me as I listened to this description of Otisville. But first and foremost, I was reminded of the words of a recently sentenced white collar defendant who had sought me out for advice on how to become active in the anti-incarceration movement. I got Otisville, he boasted to me, as if he'd won the lottery. I got one of those prison consultants and he hooked me up. It's like a country club there. I won't have to eat regular prison food. And they got a special diet available because of the high percentage of Hasidic Jews. There's yoga for free. I won't even have to pay a dime. And even better, there's tennis courts. I've actually already got a doubles game lined up. This description stood in very stark contrast to the prison where I spent 2010, at which the sole educational opportunities consisted of one GED course taught by a prisoner where the prisoner in charge mocked the other students, one hydroponics course for two weeks at which prisoners were taught how to grow tomatoes and water, and one computer skills course, which lasted for about 40 minutes, and during which we were instructed how to turn computers on by pushing the button on the bottom right, and then 40 minute, after 40 minutes of silence, how to push that same button to turn the computer off. This was the entirety of all the educational and vocational instruction at FCI Manchester, where, as I said, I spent 2010. I wonder how many judges have been treated to tours of facilities like this. I wonder how many judges have experienced the horror of Rikers Island. I wonder how many prosecutors have spent time there. Those who have, or at this point, pretty much any New Yorker with a pulse understands that Rikers Island is no country club. Young men like Khalif Browder, who perished as a result of the psychological trauma inflicted upon him after three years of institutionalized terror, did not have a prison consultant to prepare him for what he was about to experience at Rikers. He did not have a doubles tennis game waiting for him upon his arrival there. No, what he encountered was a reign of terror. A reign of terror and torture at the hands of correctional officers and then in some cases by other prisoners while COs looked on and even encouraged it. A reign of terror that was for far too long tolerated by the system a system whose nonchalant attitude seemed to be that if you ended up in Rikers, then you probably deserved whatever you got. For 51 years, and just in case you're wondering, you didn't miss our anniversary celebration last year because we haven't had it yet, the Center for New York City Affairs has been shining a light on the disparities that plague New York City. Disparities in housing, healthcare, education, and now criminal justice. For the first time, we shine our light specifically on Rikers Island. We are an applied policy research institute that drives policy innovation. We work where people's lives intersect with government and community organizations to illuminate the impact of policy on the lives of ordinary people with a special focus on forgotten people, people who have been written off by the rest of society, the invisible children and families of New York City, and all too often, the families at Rikers Island. But we don't just highlight problems. We also strive to focus on solutions. And that's why we're here today, to ask 
Can Rikers Island be reformed, or must it be shut down? And if it is shut down, what are the right alternatives? What community-based support must be in place? And when can we create policies, and how do we create policies that can transform the culture of Rikers Island and all of our prisoners to become as humane as those in other civilized democracies? We will now begin by hearing the moral case for shutting down Rikers. That will be presented to us by Glenn Martin. Glenn Martin is the founder of Just Leadership USA, an organization devoted to cutting the U.S. correctional population in half by 2030. Mr. Martin is a national leader and criminal justice reform advocate who spent six years in New York State prisons. Prior to founding Just Leadership USA, he served for seven years as Vice President of Public Affairs at the Fortune Society and six years as co-director of the National Hire Network at the, at the Legal Action Center. He serves on Governor Cuomo's Reentry and Reintegration Council, the advisory board of the Vera Institute's Public Health and Mass Incarceration Initiative, the National Network for Safe Communities, and the Executive Session on Community Corrections at Harvard University. He also regularly contributes his expertise on MSNBC, Fox News, but we'll forgive you for that, <laughs> CNN. No, it's important, it's important. It's important to speak to those who are not already believers, CNN, Al Jazeera, and C-SPAN as well. So without further ado, Glenn Martin. You trying to say the Koch brothers are not believers? It's not what I've been hearing lately. Uh, good afternoon. So thank you to the new school, Jeff, thank you for that uh, great introduction. So less than 300 feet from the runways of LaGuardia, there lies a long-standing and notorious stain on this city's integrity. Rikers Island and its 10 jail complexes loom over the East River, where they remain largely out of sight and out of mind. On any given day, thousands of New Yorkers languish there where they're exposed to a, quote, deep-seated culture of violence, in the words of a report issued last year by the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. A deadly culture of brutality pervades the island, inflicting irreparable physical and emotional trauma on the men, women, and adolescents housed there. In June 1987, I sat in a holding cell at a building called the Six Building, one of the 10 jails on Rikers, awaiting transportation to court. At the time, there were over 20,000 people detained in New York City jails. Another adolescent, maybe 17 years old or so, not much older than I was at the time, walked over to me in the holding cell and said to me, give me a jacket. The average person in the average situation might suggest that giving up the jacket was the best course of action. But after growing up in the tough streets of Bed-Stuy and learning how to survive on Rikers, one, I was no longer the average person, and two, Rikers certainly wasn't the average situation. Surrendering my jacket would have been surrendering my long-term safety on Rikers. Since the residents ran the jail and officers empowered their favorites, when I told him that he would have to fight me for the jacket, I hadn't realized that many of the other young people in the cell were actually with him, and that the fight for my jacket would result in being beat up in that cell by over five people. As we fought, the COs looked on. They laughed and they joked, before eventually yelling for us to break it up. I emerged from that fight with a black eye and four stab wounds each inflicted by writing pens that were melted and fashioned into shanks. One behind my head, two in my lower back, and one on my neck, where he left the pen protruding once the fight ended. I lost the fight, I kept my jacket, I earned respect, and I quickly learned that the COs didn't give a damn whether I lived or not. 27 years later, on January 1st, 2014, I attended Mayor de Blasio's inauguration by invitation. 
I see Devon in the audience who is sitting right next to me in that moment. Like the hundreds of other New Yorkers who attended that winter morning, I braved the unbelievably frigid temperatures to watch as the city ushered in a new era. The mayor's words brought hope to the audience as he stated that, quote, we see what binds all New Yorkers together and understanding that big dreams are not a luxury reserved for a privileged few, but the animating force behind every community and every borough. He went on to say, quote, the spark that ignites our unwavering resolve to do everything possible to ensure that every girl and boy, no matter what language they speak, what subway line they ride, what neighborhood they call home, that every child has the chance to succeed. I and others braved the frigid cold to listen closely to our new mayor. I could feel the long-standing residual pain of my 27-year-old stab wounds, pain that became more pronounced in bad weather, pain that often brings me back to that day in 1987 in that holding cell on Rikers. That day, I struggled to ignore the pain, clutching the then lukewarm cup of apple cider. Within minutes, the cup was now as frigid as my outer limbs. The mayor said, quote, we are all called upon, we are all called to put an end to economic and social inequities that threaten to unravel the city we love. I held my head up high with pride. A mayor that understood, I remember thinking. Then the mayor talked of taking dead aim at the tale of two cities. The more he mentioned the two cities in New York, the more I wondered whether he understood that there was a third city and not just two. A city where human beings, children like Khalif Browder, are robbed of their sanity, their dignity, their families, their communities, and sometimes their lives. After the ceremony, I stood in line on that frigid winter day, not to simply take a picture with our mayor, but to make a plea. After a couple of hours in a line that wrapped around City Hall, barely able to feel my fingertips, I made it into the building. The line inside, winding through the beautiful architecture of the building, was as long as the line outside. Finally, after engaging in casual holiday conversation with some of New York's most elite, I was summoned to walk over to the towering mayor for my picture. With my heart racing, instead of posing, I turned to the mayor and said, Mr. Mayor, with all due respect, I trust that you and I will have many opportunities to take a picture together. I'm here to ask you to close Rikers. The mayor tilted his head, looked down at me quizzically, and said, why do you believe that? I responded, it's an insidious place, a place that breeds violence and crime, a factory of despair, and corrupt beyond reform. Please close that place. Mayor de Blasio thanked me, turned for a pick, then asked for my card and said his chief of staff would be in touch. That call never came. I launched Just Leadership USA in November 2014 and continued to share my vision for closing Rikers with my friends, family, and colleagues and members of the media, many of whom responded incredulously, as the mayor did on that day at City Hall. One person I respect tremendously told me I was, quote, crazy when I pose that vision to people who have been detained there, however, there's always a resounding amen. To be balanced, we've begun to see movement. Rikers Island, the nation's largest jail complex, is finally coming under scrutiny, and questions are being raised about how to address the violence, abuse, and scandal that have become endemic there. Intention on Rikers is for good reason. People who are held on Rikers, the majority without being convicted of a crime, simply because they cannot afford bail, must survive barbaric conditions. Many don't survive on the island. Jason Echeverria and Carlos Mercado both died on Rikers. Victor Woods went into a violent seizure while a guard sat watching him and drinking his cup of coffee. There were 10 deaths last year alone, and stabbings and slashings have doubled since 2010. Yesterday, the city announced it had reached settlements for a total of over $5 million for the deaths of Carlos and Jason. The settlement sizes are indications, I believe, that the city recognizes that there is a problem. Unfortunately, other people don't survive the trauma of Rikers once they're off the island. Can anyone read about the saga of Khalif Browder without concluding that something is profoundly wrong here? And the scars of Rikers, both physical 
and emotional, the trauma, remain with New Yorkers who have been there for the rest of their lives. Our country is in the midst of an unprecedented debate about mass incarceration, racial disparities, policing, and the very meaning of justice and safety. There's growing bipartisan consensus that our current criminal justice system is broken. We're using criminalization and incarceration to solve social problems, leading to a disaster for communities, especially communities of color. The case against Rikers Island is one with a long pedigree amongst New York's most marginalized communities. These communities, in particular those who've borne the brunt of the suffering caused by Rikers Island, were forcefully articulating the urgency of closure long before criminal justice reform enjoyed its national moment. The omission of their voices and leadership in this discussion isn't trivial. Silence on this point, in my opinion, is deafening and speaks volumes about the social distance between those who influence policy and those they impact. With the current debate, reform versus shutting it down, the horror of Rikers Island is presented to us as a recent revelation brought to us by some sort of elite generosity. Exposing Rikers' grisly record was made entirely possible by the courage of those who've suffered within its walls, like Khalif Browder. Here in New York City, city leaders are finally seriously discussing reforming Rikers. There's only one reform serious enough to warrant consideration here. Close Rikers. Thank you very much, Glenn, for that very powerful personal statement. I forgot, uh, I neglected earlier on to do the most rudimentary thing one typically does when he begins to address an audience, which is to introduce myself. Um, so you're like, who is that guy up there in the suit? Um, my name is Jeff Smith. I'm uh, an assistant professor of politics and advocacy at the Milano School. Um, which is the new school's graduate school in international affairs, management, and urban policy. And the urban policy program is where I teach. A couple other people I wanted to, to introduce and also neglected to introduce up front are the executive director of the Center for New York City Affairs, Kristen Morse. and then a few of the staff people who helped make today possible. Abigail Kramer, Alex Bryden, and Emily Springer. Thank you all. We will now hear uh, the public policy case for reforming Rikers by Scott Stringer. Scott Stringer is a native New Yorker who grew up in Washington Heights. He's first elected to the State Assembly in 1992, where he served for 13 years prior to his election as Manhattan Borough President in 2005. He served two terms as Borough President and then was elected Comptroller of the City of New York in 2013. Throughout his career, Scott's fought for New York's middle class, strengthening the city's fiscal health and consistently championing good government. The New York Times described him as a public servant committed to the principles of good government and a strong voice for civil rights, marriage equality, a defender of immigrants and the poor. But criminal justice has always been at the heart of Comptroller Stringer's advocacy. He fought prison construction and promoted Rockefeller drug reform as a member of the assembly. He dedicated tens of thousands of dollars in funding for reentry services as borough president and spoke out forcefully about the need for increased funding for civil legal services and stop and frisk reform, leading all 12 community boards in Manhattan to join together to call for fundamental change. More recently, as comptroller, his data-driven look at Rikers Island has shown in painful detail the fiscal and human cost of the extraordinary mismanagement we have seen. Comptroller Springer. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank Professor Smith for that kind introduction and for inspiring young people to improve our criminal justice system. And I wanna thank you, Glenn, for your advocacy on behalf of those who were incarcerated as well as their families. You've been a guiding light for many of us over the years, both at the Fortune Society 
and today at Just Leadership USA. You were a tough act to follow, and the only thing I asked of this forum was that I would speak ahead of you, and they wouldn't do it. Let's give it up for Glenn. Prison reform has been a struggle for decades, as many of you in this room can attest. 20 years ago, I was a member of the New York State Assembly at a time when prison construction was seen as an economic salvation for upstate communities. Back then, these Republican senators were using prisons as their central economic development tool. You pour the concrete, you put up the razor wire, and in 18 months, you can start shipping more black and brown children from downstate to upstate prisons. That was the plan, and that's what they did. And the problems that resulted, including over-incarceration, didn't concern these folks. They weren't trying to reduce crime. They were trying to create a community with the prison at its centerpiece. But while that was going on, a lot of us had a different vision back then. We knew the better course was more education, more jobs, and an action plan to help people live productive lives. Because building prisons is the easiest thing you can do. But investing in our children and ensuring that they have the tools they need to succeed, that's the hard part. Which is why at this moment, this moment in history, we must get this right. Now, this is not a new conversation. The battle to reform the prison industrial complex actually goes back nearly 100 years. 80 years ago, 80 years ago, Correction Commissioner Austin McCormick made a surprise visit to New York City's Blackwell Island Penitentiary, describing it as, quote, the worst prison in the world, the most corrupt prison in the country a vicious circle of depravity. That visit helped to galvanize public support for bringing the correction system into the 20th century. It replaced the out-of-date facilities with a new jail at Rikers Island. The vision, according to the New York Times in 1886, was to build a model penitentiary, which in all its plans and parts would be the most perfect prison in the world. Sadly, that vision was never realized. Practically before the paint was dry, concerns were being raised about Rikers even back then. Inspectors warned of health hazards associated with fires at nearby dumps, and violence, gangs, and corruption took hold. The dream of a model penitentiary had quickly turned into a nightmare for inmates, correction officers, and the city as a whole. Today, we once again stand at a crossroads in our battle to reform our criminal justice system. In July, a sitting president visited a federal prison for the first time in history. States across the country are enacting meaningful bail reform, ensuring that people are not in prison solely for the crime of being poor. Here in New York City, we're beginning to implement reforms at Rikers through the Nunes Settlement Agreement, developing a new use of force policy, providing prompt reporting of every use of force incident, adding 8,000 video cameras within two years, and also seeking an alternative site off Rikers for the placement of juveniles. The settlement agreement is a major accomplishment. We as a city have many people to thank, the Legal Aid Society, the City Law Department, to U.S. Attorney Baharo, whose groundbreaking report on violence at Rikers helped propel the city to settle. And clearly, we have a long journey ahead. As controller, it's my job to monitor the finances of all city agencies and measure their performance. And right now, Rikers Island is a case study in poor outcomes. Now, I want you to take a look at these slides. A recent analysis by my office found that the cost per inmate has soared 67 percent since 2007. You see the orange line. Meanwhile, the inmate population, as shown in the yellow line, has dropped 27 percent since 2007. At the same time, on the next slide, we see the rate of assaults increased by 19 percent in FY15. That's the gray bar. 
So meanwhile, the cost per inmate at Rikers has now climbed to $112,000 annually. $112,000 a year. That's more than twice the cost in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Cook and Miami-Dade counties. So we need to keep a laser focus on how the mayor and the commissioner implement the Nunez settlement because we can't have history repeating itself. In 1980, Rikers was under a federal court mandate to address concerns about overcrowding. By the late 1990s, a federal monitor had been appointed to supervise solitary units and staffing decisions. There were significant reductions in violence, but the improvements were just short-lived. As former Commissioner Horn, who is with us today, has said, quote, a monitor calls balls and strikes. A monitor can't make things happen. So while the settlement may help to end the culture of violence, I believe we have to be looking even further down the road. We need to create a 21st century correction system that is a national model rather than an urban shame. As we implement the consent decree, I believe we must also plan for the day when Rikers Island can be safely and responsibly closed because part of the problem at Rikers is Rikers itself. Now last November on a visit there, I saw the antiquated classrooms that passed for schools. I visited the gymnasium of the juvenile facility where floorboards were destroyed by Hurricane Sandy were never replaced. The signs of decay are apparent to anyone who has spent time at Rikers. The crumbling physical plant undermines safety and security, putting correction officers and prisoners in harm's way. And it sends a troubling message about how we believe people ought to be treated. For, uh, for years, the idea of closing Rikers would have been a non-starter. But thanks to a declining jail population, closing Rikers for good, finally, is a goal that must be studied with an implementation plan. By working to get juveniles off the island as Nunez demands, we can begin to chip away at the headcount. By finding more humane settings for mentally ill prisoners, we can improve lives and take another step toward closure. And by enacting bail reform, we can stop sending many nonviolent offenders to Rikers in the first place. What we need is a system that delivers justice and security so that New York remains the safest city in America. And the only way to do this is to create a system that recognizes the difference between violent, nonviolent, mentally ill, and most importantly, child. That's how you build a safe city. And that's how you build a just city. Now, none of these changes will happen overnight. It's going to take years of planning. The benefits to our city could be significant. The challenge is great, but the opportunity is even greater. We got to work together to figure out how to shut it down once and for all. We got to transform our jail system from an aging embarrassment to a 21st century success. And let's once again go back into the business of leading other cities across the country and across the world. We used to do that more. And that's because we planned. We understand how to build. We understand how to incorporate justice into what our city represents. That has got to be the goal. And today's conference for me is the beginning of what I hope is a real conversation with City Hall. Government officials have to get it. They have to understand it. And the panelists today, I think, are a great start. Glenn, Professor Smith, uh, Commissioner Horn, we have a great group today. And let's get busy and let's change the system for once and for all. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you.